I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. This is our second Fellowship Fund webinar. Uh, again, I'm joined here with Abby, who's our program coordinator with for the Fellowship Fund. And joining us this time is at Farm Credit is Gary Madison, Grisha Lapton with, again, Farm Credit. They'll be providing their perspective on a business plan, which again, we know is a huge hurdle that our members go through when completing the Fellowship Fund. So we'll start off with going to go up the Fellowship Fund again, quick overview with a few updates. If you have any questions, put them in the chat Q&A, and we'll answer them as we go. And we'll have a few minutes at the end for Q&A. But um, yeah, Abby, if you'd like to get started. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, looks good. Okay. Okay, we'll just jump right in. I'm going to do a quick overview of the program, and then we'll get into a little bit more into the application. Um, this is a little similar to the first video we did in the beginning with the presentation, but a lot of people found it really helpful, so I thought I would do it again. Um, like Diego said, if you have any questions, just put it in the chat or the Q&A, and I'll get to them as Farm Credit's doing their segment. So. Okay, so the Fellowship Fund was established in 2011 and has awarded over $4.5 million in grants to nearly 1,100 farmer veterans. Um, the small grant program provides direct assistance to farmer veterans with awards ranging from $1,000 to $5,000. Um, the purchases are made on behalf of the farmer veteran for equipment and other related supplies that will create a long-lasting positive impact on their ad business. Um, one thing to note, we do not give the awardees the funding directly. Um, they actually go to their preferred vendors and request an invoice, or if they can't get an invoice, we'll help them out with that. And the FBC pays the vendors directly. Um, this is just so then we all know that the funds are being used to go towards the individual's agriculture business. Um, as many of you know, the applications are open right now. Um, you can just go to our website, farmvetco.org, and it'll be the first thing you see pop up will be the button for the application. Um, and those applications must be submitted by February 14th. Pretty easy day to remember. <laughs> and then um, some major sponsors include Kubota, ADM, Farm Credit, and Tractor Supply Company. As you can see, some people use it for honey processing equipment, Fencing supplies, um, the list goes on and on, greenhouses, walk behind tractors. And then as many of you know, um, we do have a partnership with Kubota. They offer our um, members a discount on Kubota equipment, um, but they also have a, a program called Gear to Give, um, which provides equipment and grants through the fellowship fund. Um, sometimes this can get a little confusing, but the Gear to Give application is actually integrated into the fellowship application. So you'll just fill out the application like normal. And at the very end, there'll be a question asking if you would also like to apply for the gear to give portion. And then there's just a few more questions about your equipment needs. Um, and then each year, Kubota does give away five pieces of, of equipment through the program. Usually um, it's about one or two pieces of hay equipment and tractors as well, very nice tractors. <laughs> and then um, since 2015, the program has awarded 46 pieces of equipment to Farmer Veteran Coalition members, which is absolutely amazing. Um, there's some of our past awardees of the Gear to Give program. Okay, so now some requirements. Um, so you must be a veteran member of the Farmer Veteran Coalition. This means that you've been verified, uh, your service has been verified through either IDME or our support center. Um, if you want any clarification on that, or just want to double check, reach out to us. Uh, if you were verified, then you would have received a membership card in your email when you joined. You must have served or are currently serving at any branch of the US military, received an honorable characterization of service upon discharge from the military, other characterizations of service may be accepted on a case-by-case -case basis. We just need a little bit more clarification. Currently serving service members must provide a letter of support from their commanding officer or designated representative attesting to their characterization of service. Again, 
Um, some people will sometimes ask for templates of this letter. We have those as well. And then you must have an ad business in operation as well as a business plan. Um, if you don't have a business plan, we're about to help you create one. So, um, and then the fellowship fund is designed for nonprofit, or I'm sorry, for profit ag businesses. Nonprofit entities are not eligible to apply this year. Previous fellowship recipients are only eligible to apply again if previously awarded $1,000 or less. So this is usually the gift certificates for tractor supply, um, things like that. However, all are welcome to apply to receive equipment through Kubota's Care to Give program. So let's say that I was awarded $3,000 last year. Um, as I explained earlier, you would just fill out the fellowship fund application like normal. And then at the end, make sure to select that you would also like to apply for Care to Give. You must be fully willing to part participate in the program. This includes um, proper supports of filling out our survey after the fellowship fund cycle has come to a complete, um, mentoring other farmer veterans, and of course, making a positive impact on the farmer veteran community. Um, this is all really important to us, um, especially the reports and the pictures we get back. We send those to our funders so then they can see the impacts that they've made. Okay, so there's three things you'll need to include um, or attach with your application. That is a DD-214, make sure this is redacted. Um, and then you wanna make sure that's one that has your characterization of service on it, which is usually a member four. And then a short essay response. This is a simple one page max, uh, one paragraph essay that you'll attach. Um, the prompt is actually, I have it right here, um, describe how your military service has helped you in the food slash farming industry and what other life experiences have led you to choose a career in ag. Um, so just kind of think about that. And then, of course, the business plan. The business plan for our application must be no more than 15 pages. You can save the application this year and come back to it later. All you have to do is check the checkbox. I believe it's at the top. Um, next to save my progress and resume later. And it will send you an email to the email address that you put in and it will just have you create a username and password and that will be your login for accessing your application later. If you have any trouble with this, of course, you can reach out. Um, we might be able to recover it on our end. Um, and I also just suggest always copying and pasting your responses into a Word document. That's always good. We all know how technology and internet is sometimes. Um, and then this is really important. The application does consist of conditional questions. This means as you fill up the application, additional questions will appear based on your responses. Some people come to the application the day before it's due and they look at it and they're like, oh, there's not many questions. There's a few more questions. You just have to get through it. And um, it usually takes about an average of an hour to two hours. Um, just It just depends on how um, detailed you get with your responses. Okay, so now scoring. Um, so for those who don't know, FBC staff members just do not score your applications. We have a party of third-party reviewers, a group of third-party reviewers. Um, it's usually close to about 60 ad professionals. Um, your application gets scored twice by two different reviewers. They're not associated with each other at all, um, or the applicant at all, obviously. And, um, and yeah, so they look over your application and they're giving this rubric that has seven categories on it. They rate one through five on each category. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those. Um, the first one is farm training slash experience. So does the candidate have the training or experience necessary to succeed in their business? A lot of people overthink this. You don't have to have a diploma in agriculture or anything. Um, think about some of the smaller things that made an impact on um, you succeeding in, their, in your business. So um, this could be a workshop, something your local ag extension put on, um, this webinar, a podcast we've done, anything like that. Um, there's various ways that you can learn now, especially online. So make sure to include as much as possible on that. Category number two, transferable skills. 
Um, so this kind of goes back to that essay that I talked about earlier. Uh, does the candidate possess skills from the military service and or previous careers that will be valuable to their farming venture? Um, and then category number three, personal investment. So has the candidate already made a significant personal investment of time and resources into their farming career? So what have you put into this so far? Um, even if you're in the very beginning, um, have you got land? Uh, that training or experience that we talked about earlier, equipment, livestock, things like that. Category number four, strategic request. This is really important and it needs to be very detailed and um, they're kind of looking for, you know, will the requested equipment or materials strategically advance the candidate's business? Will these pieces of equipment or supplies, will this make a long lasting impact? And, um, you know, we, we just want to see that the piece of equipment will uh, kind of be a game changer for your business. Number five, vision goals for the future. Does the candidate articulate how they see the fellowship fitting into their long-term business and life goals? So think long-term, uh, how will getting this piece of equipment help you accomplish your goals faster? Um, we just really wanna see that. And then category number six, community involvement. Has the candidate demonstrated previous involvement with the Farmer Veteran Coalition or veteran and or farming communities? So have you gone to a state chapter meeting? Have you gone to, um, your local Ag Extensions workshop? Um, are you HBH certified, Home Grown by Hero certified? Uh, have you volunteered at your local farmer's market? All kinds of things. And then the last one, number seven, is unique impact. So what makes you so special? Uh, does the candidate combine solid qualifications with a unique perspective, experience, or skill that would add to the fellowship community? So what makes you stand out? What's that niche that you have? What's that skill that you have? Um, so yeah, those are the seven categories to kind of make sure that you um, include in your application somewhere and make that point. And as always, um, here is our support email and phone number. Phone number is kind of easy to remember, 855-FBC-FARM. Or of course, you can always contact me. I am happy to answer any questions. And I know a lot of you sometimes have very specific questions or um, questions about your eligibility or some of the requirements, give me a call, I'm happy to help. So um, I think everyone's probably anxiously waiting to get to the business plan part of this. So I'll hand it over to Chris and Gary. Great, thank you very much. Um, so Abby, if you wanna put our slides up, um, we can, or, or Diego, uh, and we'll just tell you to advance them. There we go. Okay. So um, brief introduction. Uh, my name is Christopher Lawton. I'm with Farm Credit East. We are um, the Farm Credit affiliate that serves um, New England, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, the Farm Credits, we're part of the National Farm Credit System, which serves all 50 states plus Puerto Rico. And um, it would be worth, um, you know, as a side note, it would be worth connecting with your local Farm Credit uh, affiliate and seeing what resources that they may have to help you um, in your ag journey. Um, if you go to farmcredit.com, you can type in your zip code and it will give you the Farm Credit uh, Association that serves your area if you're not already uh, knowledgeable of, of who does that. Um, and uh, we are all farmer owned cooperatives and we're committed to serving agriculture throughout the country. Um, let me also say that um, whether your service is current or past, uh, thank you very much for your service and commitment to our country. Um, Gary, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Um, Gary Madison, I work for the Trade Association for Farm Credit, so I'm based in Washington, D.C., but currently at my farm in New Hampshire. Um, I also happen to be the president of the board of the Farmer Veteran Coalition, which I've served on for a little more than 10 years now. So i um, glad to be with all of you who are here with us today for this, this webinar, and uh, let's get going, Chris, on some business planning help. Sure. So if we could have the next slide, please. So um, this presentation, we're going to talk about the business plan portion of the application um, for the um, for the FEC uh, Fellowship Award. Um, and a business plan is useful 
uh, for a couple of reasons beyond the application. Um, one is, as Gary told me earlier when we talked about, about putting this presentation together, is that a business plan is a way of explaining your business to someone else who can help you. Um, it's, it's a concise description of your business, the who, what, when, and why, and how um, of your business. And it's also useful uh, for your own purposes in that it kind of forces you to put your thoughts on paper and um, get your arms around what you're actually trying to do and achieve with your business uh, rather than just be, being kind of aimless and, um, you know, doing things. Um, so the who, the who is, um, you know, you basically, but also, and we'll get into each one of these questions as we go through it, but, um, you know, you plus your team and that team could be employees. It could be mentors. It could be advisors. Um, it could be peers in the industry who have, uh, who are helping you out in some way. Um, so it's, it's all the people portion of, of your business. The what is what you're going to do, what product or service you're going to offer. Uh, the when is is obviously either uh, you've been in business for some time and you have a track record or you're planning to start something in the future. Uh, the where is kind of obvious. It's where you plan to um, produce your products as well as where you plan to sell them. Um, the why is kind of your mission statement, and we'll get into that. And then the how you will make money is um, is kind of the most important part of it, I guess. Um, and many people get into agriculture, particularly veterans, uh, with a number of non-financial goals. And those are great. Um, and that's one of the great things about running a small business or a farm is that you can run the business the way you think it should be run and, um, you know, ach achieve or, or pursue a number of non-financial goals. But one of the things that I like to say is that profitability is a prerequisite. Uh, to achieving those non-financial goals. If you're not profitable, you're not financially sustainable. Um, and you may be pursuing grant funding or nonprofit funding or something like that, and that, that's great as well. But really, you should strive to be financially sustainable on your own. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. Oh, Gary, you have any comments on that before we go ahead? No, keep going. You're doing great. Okay, so getting started. Um, this is kind of like your, you know, sort of your title page or the, the, you know, the first few pages of your business plan. Um, your, you know, your company name, obviously, uh, mission statement, and a mission statement should be, um, you know, we'll cover that in the next slide, but it should be pretty, pretty basic and pretty concise. Um, you want to talk about your primary business activities. Um, is there a product or service or experience that you're going to be offering to uh, to your clients, to the consumer that's going to be, um, you know, monetized in some way? How are you going to perform these services or produce these products? Um, what is your marketing plan? Who is going to buy or pay for these products or services or experiences that you're offering? Um, talk a little bit about your management, what your skills are, what your background is. Um, how you're going to um, fulfill the functions that are not within your area of expertise. You know, if you're not if you're not an expert on record keeping and bookkeeping, how are you going to get that function done? Um, and then your financial uh, plans and projections and records will be the the final piece of that. Um, so if, on the next slide, we cover mission statement. If I could have the next slide. So the mission statement, again, clearly and briefly states the purpose and values of your organization. Um, it describes the ultimate goal of your organization and it, it don't cover the how in the mission statement. That can come later, but basically what you wanna do, you know, in a sentence or two um, with your business. So the mission statement of Farm Credit East, my organization, we're a large organization, we have, um, more than 500 employees. We have 18,000 customers, um, but our mission statement is just one sentence. Um, we're committed to the success of our customers by providing high value credit and financial services. Done. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a very concise message of uh, the, at a high level of what we wanna do. Um, you know, 
you could mention for a farm, our farm is going to grow good food, make good money and be good people. And there you're covering uh, your product, your profitability and, um, you know, your commitment to the to the community in one sentence there. So, you know, it's okay if it's two sentences or, or a little bit longer, but it shouldn't be much more than that. Um, if we could go to the next slide. So your primary business activities, um, you know, in a nutshell, what do you plan to do? Uh, here we say ABC Gardens is going to sell ornamental and edible landscape, um, edible garden plants for home gardeners and landscape contractors. That's our, that's our main business activity. And we're going to do this by we're going to grow ornamental flowers and vegetable plants in our greenhouses and we're going to purchase some landscape plants for resale to round out what we produce ourselves um so again you know it's concise and it covers the key things um you don't need to go into um you know like let's say we're going to do uh vegetables for our business uh you know the national market for broccoli is x million dollars and uh, you know, is sold in, in grocery stores around the country. You know, you don't need to go into like those kind of extraneous details. We, what, what the FEC wants to know and what most of the people who are going to read your business plan want to know is what are you going to be doing and, and how are you going to do it? Um, if we could have the next slide, please. So the marketing plan. Um, think hard about who are your customers. And this is going to vary a lot depending on what your business model is. So in the case of uh, that ABC garden, uh oh, looks like you locked primarily up Chris. homeowners within, within a 10 mile radius of your business. Um, and again, if you're, if you're a retail business, And think about being a destination, um, but you know your core core customer base is going to be within that um, relatively short driving distance of your business. Um, how will you attract new business? Again, in the example that we're talking about, uh, they're going to use online advertising. They're going to use social media. Curbside appeal, big part of a resident of a uh, retail business, especially if you're on a heavily traveled road. Um, you know, having that curbside appeal that entices people to stop and check you out. Um, that's really important. Um, what is your pricing strategy? You know, are you going to be high end, mid tier value and make sure your offerings match your pricing? Um, probably not the best uh, avenue to go down being the cheapest guy in town, uh, unless you have some kind of real advantage that, uh, that others don't have. Um, Mid-tier is, is a good place to play. High-end can be great and be profitable, but you got to make sure that you're offering high-end products and experiences. Um, and then how are you going to ensure repeat sales? How are you going to get that customer to return and buy to you again, buy from you again? Uh, loyalty programs, newsletters, discounts, um, ways to keep in touch with the customer so it's not just a one-and-done uh, shopping experience for that customer. And, of course, providing great service to your uh, customer. Now, if you're a yep. wholesale business, um, your marketing plan may be totally different. If you're, say, a dairy, um, your marketing plan may be to have the co-op pick up the dairy, pick up the milk every day um, at your farm, and you know they do the marketing essentially for you. Um, so, much different marketing plan. It's important to make it applicable to your business model. Uh, go ahead, Gary. What were you going to say? I was going to say, just to, to summarize these first few slides, if you were to write, first of all, writing a, a business plan, it doesn't have to be 150 pages or photos or any of that kind of stuff, which you might see in online examples. Um, you need it to fit the scale of, of what you're trying to do. So for, let's say, a, a, a small direct-to-retail vegetable operation, you're growing the vegetables, you're selling them in a consumer supported agriculture, a CSA shares environment or uh, farmer's market or farm stand, you don't need a big business plan. You almost could take these first five slides uh, with these questions, like the one we're looking at now, and just write in your own answer, right? I mean, but the key is 
writing down the answer. You don't, obviously you don't have to, have, you can say my customers will be homeowners with a 10 mile radius, or I will uh, go to three farmers markets in the Susquehanna Valley or whatever it is that you're going to write down. But if you write it down, you're thinking about it, you're making a commitment. And in turn, if you have to tell anybody else what you're going to be doing, you've got it written down. If you write it down, you can review it. You can look at it a month from now and say, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to actually, I'm going to do four farmers markets, or I've decided I'm going to have an online presence or whatever. You get to revise and change. Writing it down makes it more familiar to you. And it also helps you keep in mind the things that you may not necessarily talk about, like a marketing plan. You may be really interested in how you produce the particular vegetables, which is a really nice conversation to have with somebody. But if you're trying to get them to help you accomplish something in your business, you need to be able to talk to them about these various parts of, of a business plan, like the marketing plan or um, uh, the, the, the financial side of it, which we'll get to in another slide. Or, you know, describing your primary business activities in a way that shows somebody else that you have thought about this. If you want to think of another really good purpose for writing down a business plan, even just taking one sheet of paper and fitting it on that, answering these questions that we're giving you, a really good reason to do it is to be able to have those thoughts in your head so you've got an answer at at your fingertips to be able to give an answer to somebody showing that you've thought about it, showing that you have, have at least understood that you, you're going to have customers, right? And where are you going to find them? And uh, what are you going to sell to them? All those very basic questions may be obvious to you, but writing it down makes it so that you can communicate it to somebody else. Yeah, that's, right. that's great insight, Gary. Yeah. Um, one other thing that we that we haven't talked about is, um, <clears throat> and this uh, comes speaks to the how to ensure repeat sales. Think about what your hook is going to be or what your angle is going to be. If you're if you're going to be direct to consumer or even B two B, you know you want to sell the story of your business, not just your product, but also the the um, the intangibleness. Um, of why it makes sense to buy from you instead of Joe down the street. Um, you know, you, you want to think about what makes your product or service, you know, different or unique or better than what else is out there. Let's face it, in this country, we're kind of spoiled, right? Like, you know, whatever we need is available. Uh, so unless you're introducing something that's really completely new to the marketplace, and that's pretty unlikely, the consumer is getting it from somewhere else already. Like if you're going to grow vegetables, like you need to not just, you're not just offering vegetables and, you know, build it and they will come. You need to convince someone to, to buy your vegetables instead of going to the grocery store or from the next guy at the farmer's market stand or whatever else. And so, you know, think about what makes your product special and that can be your story. You know, you're a veteran, you're uh, producing your product in a certain way. Uh, there's something special about your farm. Uh, you know, your backstory is is really special or you're doing, you know, you're working with other veterans in the community or, you know, think about what you're doing that makes your story special and sell that story. It's not just more, it's more than just, uh, you know, the tomatoes that you're growing on your farm. It's the whole um, backstory behind it that makes your tomatoes worth what they're worth. Um, so that's something to think about. Um and then another thing, we don't have a slide on this, but uh, one of the things that's a component of a business plan is management or as I think you referred to it for the application business readiness. Uh, am I getting that right? Um, you know, you, you want to convince um, a lender or a um, if you're borrowing money from a relative, maybe, or, or if you're applying for a, a fellowship from the FEC, you want to think about uh, convincing, how are you going to convince them that you have the chops to pull this off? And that can be a combination. Ideally, it's a combination of education and experience. Um, so you want to have some experience in uh, agriculture, maybe working on someone else's farm or farming on your own for a certain period of time. Um, or maybe there's transferable experience from your service. Um, 
you know, as well as education, maybe it's maybe it's a university degree, or maybe it's uh, you took a short course at a uh, trade trade with a trade group or with a university extension service or something like that. Um, but basically, and the more of one you have, the less you need of the other, or the less of one you have, the more you need of the other. So, if you have less educational background, that experience is going to count more heavily. Um, or if you have a lot of experience, maybe you don't need as much on the education side. Um, but ideally, it's a combination of the two that are going to convince someone that your business is viable because, you know, you have that those skills that are needed to pull this off. Gary, you have anything to add before we go on to the, the loan officer piece? Let, let's go on to that one. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. Yeah. So if you're approaching a loan officer or any kind of lender, whether it's USDA or a bank or farm credit, um, they're going to want to know similar things. They're going to want to know um, if you have an existing business, they're going to want to see your last couple of years of income statements. Uh, you know, what's your track record? Um, and they're going to want to see projections for at least a couple of years. You know, it, going beyond that, it becomes too theoretical to really be that useful. But the first couple of years, you should be able to realistically project where your business is headed. Um, are you seeing sales growth and where is that coming from? Um, you're also going to want to produce a current balance sheet, um, either for you personally, or if you have an entity that your business is like an LLC or something, um, a balance sheet for you as well as for your business. Um, if you're a startup, um, you know, realistic projections for the first couple of years and with an emphasis on realistic, um, you know, you're probably not going to get to be a million dollar business in two, three years. Um, you know, your sales growth is going to come slow at first and then hopefully accelerate as you are able to establish yourself a little bit. Um, a current balance sheet list, list everything that you own and everything you owe on that, um, where your startup capital is going to come from, in addition to what you're seeking to borrow, um, you know what are you putting into it? What are you bringing to the table? Um, and then off-farm income can be critically important for any startup and even for an established business that's in its early years. Um, you know, don't, it's it's probably not realistic to expect that your new fledgling business is going to support your family in the first couple of years. So having that off-farm income, whether it's for yourself or a spouse or partner, um, can be critically important in not just um, you know supporting your family, uh, but also helping support the business. And you often need to put some cash into it uh, in those early years. So those are important things that a, a loan officer is going to want to see. Um, Gary, what what say you on this? So why we brought up a loan officer here, I mean, obviously we work for an outfit that lends money, um, but I'm going to tell you your first approach should be don't borrow money. Um, you need to decide, You need, and a loan officer can actually help you do this, uh, help you figure out if you need to borrow money. Um, the, a loan officer is not going to tell you how to do a business plan and, and all that, but they can help you assess what you've got. And if you can accomplish what you want to do um, without borrowing money, you don't you, you don't you're not a real farmer just because you borrow money. You're not a real farmer just because you own land. Um, uh, what you should be thinking about and, and why we bring up the idea of a loan officer is the loan officer is kind of a, a neutral judge of. So the plan that you're giving me, can you actually do that year after year? Is it economically viable? Is it economically sustainable? Um, is it reasonable? That's what a, a loan officer's judgment is essentially doing, because their job as a loan officer is to see how you're going to pay the money back if you borrow it. Um, but what they're actually helping you to do as, a, as an applicant is understand um, what what's at risk? What do you expect to put into this business and what do you expect to get out of it? You can be in business at any size you want, selling $5,000 worth of vegetables out of your, your garden in your backyard or 50,000 or 500,000. That's up to you. 
depending on how much work you want to put into it, the resources, whether you're thinking full-time or part-time, all that's your decision. Um, the, 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 the decision of how big you're going to be should be with that understanding, and I think we can go to the next slide, um, understanding of what you expect out of your business. And I, I, we're going to show you a very simple financial statement. There it is. This is about as simple as you can describe a business. Um, it's got some financial terms in there, right? So we we'll go over it very, very quickly. Gross sales, yeah. all the things you sell. Um, the cost of goods sold, or also known as variable costs, all the seed, fertilizer, that kind of stuff that you that it takes to grow this stuff. And then it's just a math problem. Gross sales minus cost of goods sold is, is gross margin. That number, gross margin, is how good you are at what you do. One of the reasons why we're showing this five-line simple income statement as a, as a basic description of a business, we're showing it as a percentage of sales because this is benchmarked information. This is based on a study done several years ago of, of farms that sell direct to retail vegetables. The, the, the good performance, the average performance, let's say, is that if you are, whatever you're selling, whatever your total sales are, 100%, you should be sending, spending 60% of that on the ingredients, the fertilizer, the seeds, the electricity to pump your irrigation water, that sort of thing, mean, which means you have a gross margin of 40%. That gross margin can only be spent in two ways. You can spend it on overhead, which is are all the things that are fixed costs. Uh, think what's over your head. Your ceiling is a fixed cost. The barn roof, the barn itself is a fixed cost. Things like uh, insurance or rent on the land or taxes on the land, all of those things, which if you, whether you grow one tomato or 10 tons of tomato, uh, you have to spend that money, like renting the land, right? You, you have to rent the land in order to grow anything. Your variable costs, the more tomatoes you grow, the more variable costs you'll have. With overhead, it's like, yeah, that's what it is, pretty much, um, because those are fixed costs that you think of in terms of an annual um, annual expense. And then if we keep subtracting gross sales minus cost of goods sold minus overhead costs, finally equals net margin, which we also call profit. And shows a 10% net profit or a 10% profit on all those operations that you've done. This again is benchmarked average. This is what you should expect for small scale, direct to retail sales environment for uh, a, a small farm. So this fits, obviously you can see the dollars on there, 134,000 is not a full-time business, it's a part-time business. Um, but this size business, with these kind of results can easily grow into a, a full-time business at a larger number of dollars if you want to do it. If you only have the, the way to be thinking about this in terms of business planning is sort of reverse engineering. How much could you produce? Uh, if I were to come up with a, a, a really broad rule of thumb, I would say you could produce $30,000 worth of direct to retail vegetables on an acre. Now that's, you're good at it and you're doing it right and all. So 30,000, this is roughly four. So this, this operation that we're looking at the numbers for is probably four and a half acres, maybe five acres of production. Thinking in terms of how much you have, what land you have available to you, um, deciding just in big numbers, what what could you possibly gross for have for gross sales on that land, and then saying, okay, if it's a hundred thousand dollars, well, according to these farm credit guys, I'm going to send spend sixty percent of that hundred thousand dollars in sales. I'm going to spend that much on seeds and fertilizer and stuff. All of a sudden, you have a budget. So the intent or the beginnings of a budget, the intent of of showing you this is to describe that it's it's not that hard to think through what you could do for a business. Um, 
a cattle business would be different than this. Uh, you know, row crop corn and soybean is going to be obviously different percent of sales for each of those categories. But you should be able to think through what you want to accomplish in terms of a very simple financial um, five line income statement like this. Yeah, that was a great explanation, Gary. Um, and I should mention a couple of things. One is that the dollars here, obviously your dollar, you know, your dollars are going to be different. Um, this is just an example. Um, and the percentages will, will vary slightly. Um, I would say that that 60% cost of goods sold, you want it to be that 60% or less. Um, you know, if you can have a margin that's, um, that are a cost of goods sold that's less than 60%, that's 50 or 40, that's, that's even better uh, if you can pull it off. But, you know, we just wanted to have a kind of a realistic example. Uh, and these numbers are from an actual farm um, that's, that's doing reasonably well and they're profitable and a 10% net profit is not bad. Um, so one of the examples that we, one of the reasons we give this example is just to show that the money goes quickly. Uh, basically, you know, $134,000. Wow, that. Gary, you might have to uh -oh. jump in. <laughs> yep, we lost you there, Chris. So the the point Chris was making was, um, it sounds like you're doing great when you say, um, I sold because, 130. Um, there's two. When you say you're you're uh, uh, selling one hundred thirty four thousand dollars worth of stuff, it sounds like you're big time, right? But what you get to keep from that is a whole lot less because you have to remember it costs you money to produce that stuff. Um, that's what that whole idea of understanding gross margin and what to expect in this kind of business—a gross margin of forty percent—is really important because if that's that means that whatever you sell gross sales, you only have 40 percent of that to spend on overhead and and profit. And it's going to go very quickly. Sorry, yeah. you cut out there, Chris. I tried to fill yeah, in. Sorry, I, I had a little uh, a little hiccup there in my, with my internet connection. I hope I'm back now. Yes. OK, so, yeah, why don't we move on to the next slide? Real quick, I got a question in the Q&A. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. So if you're just starting out, where would you go to pull information for making your projections? Okay, so there's a few, there's a few resources. Um, if you're just starting out, some good places to go are, um, one is peers in the industry, to be honest. Um, you know, other small farmers. Um, if you can find some that will share with you, and sometimes that means going to people that are not your neighbors, directly because sometimes, you know, the neighbors are a little competitive with each other. Um, but talking to peers in the same industry, but maybe a little different geography from you uh, or far enough away that they're not your, your sort of competitor can be really useful. Um, there are some websites that have benchmark information. One really good one is called Finbin, F-I-N-B-I-N. Um, and I forget the, the website URL, but... Um, it's affiliated with, I think, the University of Minnesota or Missouri or one of the M states. Um, and if you just type in Finbin into, into Google, it'll come right up. Right up. Um, and then you can, you can select various types of farms, various scales of farms, um, and get benchmark information as to what is typical for that industry. Um, it's, melt, it's strongest for like row crops uh, or major crops. It's probably weakest for you know, specialty crops, like if you're trying to do ornamentals. Um, but that's probably one of the most robust sources of um, benchmark information out there. Um, Gary Madison also has another um, couple of resources he's putting in the chat. Um, oh, there's there's the, um, the resource that's been put up. Um, so that's a really good resource to go to. But um, like I said, peer networking is a really good way to do it. Um, you know, and then your also local, do a cash budget. Your local, your local extension agent may be able to help you also. Cooperative extension, part of the yeah. land grant university in your state. Different states have different capabilities to, to do that sort of thing. But they usually, if they can't, if they don't offer it themselves, they can point you in the right direction to find 
if not a if not a budget for a whole farm operation, which is what we're looking at on the screen, for something that is uh, an enterprise budget, like what does it cost to grow carrots or what does it cost cost to grow um, iceberg lettuce? Yeah, and then your, your most important benchmarking is gonna be against yourself once you start producing um, because each farm really has its own unique cost of production. So, um, you know, benchmarks are a good standard to aspire to, but um, your own personal experience is going to be your best teacher once you get rolling. Um, so that was a good question. Um, why don't we have the I next slide? So. Sorry, go ahead, Gary. I was going to suggest maybe just in the interest of time, we want to skip to the uh, second to last slide because we already talked about cost of goods yeah. sold and yeah. and. Uh, so we can just do a word on the financial statements. Um, and again, the, the financial statements are there, even if you don't produce them yourself, uh, especially as a startup, right? You don't have them, uh, but understanding what they are so that you know what a, uh, what a loan officer or what an advisor is going to want to talk about uh, their, being aware of what the, the general financial statements are that you might be expected to have um, is a good thing. So if we can go to slide 13, Diego. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So this is the, uh, so, the trio of, um, of financial statements that, um, that any business, and this is, this is true whether you're a small farm or General Motors, they all produce the same thing. Um, the numbers are obviously a lot different depending on your business and the scale of it, but um, it, it's it's the same statements. So the balance sheet is basically a snapshot of your financial health. So uh, the first part of it is assets. So you list out everything you own, and don't worry for now whether you have whether you owe money on it or not. It's it's whatever you own and the cash value of it. So real estate, equipment, inventory. Uh, anything of value that you own. The second part of it is liabilities. And that's that here is where you put any of that money that you owe on those uh, assets. So any loans, any obligations you have to other people, um, any uh, trade credit that you may have, uh, you know, if you owe money to vendors, uh, any of that stuff. And then the, the assets minus the liabilities equals the net worth. Um, income statement is like a, uh, a, a, a statement over time. So you basically, you pick a, a period of time. So it's either a month or a quarter or a year. Um, and you look at your, your income, any money that comes in the door, um, your expenses, any money that's going out, and then income minus expenses equals net profit. You know, pretty simple equation. Um, the cash flow statement is basically a cash flow statement is kind of the same thing as a budget. It's just one is backward looking, one's forward looking. Um, so the cash budget is basically what you think your cash flow is going to be for the next period of time, like usually a year. Um, you know, money that's going to come in and money that's going to go out. And Gary has a, a great resource that he can post in the in the chat, maybe of a, a budget template. Do you want to put that up there? I did already. Oh, Each okay. Already did. Okay, okay, I didn't see that. Farm, okay. Farmbiztrainer.com slash resources uh, yep. has uh, spreadsheets. There's one that, that is a, the vegetable business, the numbers we were looking at, uh, just sort of builds that out. There's another grass-fed beef and uh, I think grass-fed pork in there also that just gives you some guardrails, right? Some expectations based on... Uh, a percentage of sales. So understanding your business in terms of a percent of sales. What is your what are your variable costs as a percent of sales? Just an easy way to let you have a bigger business or a smaller business using that same information. And there's some live spreadsheets there. So download us download the live spreadsheet. It has the, the vegetable business one, for instance, has the numbers we were looking at previously. Uh, it's a live spreadsheet. Take out those numbers put in your numbers and the place to start is again is so how much could you produce how many acres you have if you're in direct to retail vegetables sticking with that example 
Uh, if you have an acre, you ought to be able to produce twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars worth of stuff that you're going to sell direct to retail. So um, go to the top line in income, and it's twenty-five thousand um, dollars. Then figure out, okay, so how many farmers markets do I need to go to over how many weeks to sell that much? Um, it's uh, it's it's not as hard as you might think. The main reason to do all this stuff is not to make guys like Chris and me that work for lending organizations happy. The main reason to do all this budgeting stuff is to make sure you don't mess up your retirement, um, your, you know, your life after you separate from the military. It's to make clear to yourself first, I'm going to put this much into my business and I expect to get this much out of it. It's kind of like informed consent when you go to a hospital, right? They have you sign a piece of paper that says, I understand that you're going to operate on me and I may die uh, or I may use the lose the use of my left hand or I won't be able to play the piano anymore, whatever it is. Informed consent is what we're trying to communicate, that you need to understand how much money you're putting on the line, how much you might lose, but also the good side, how much you might gain. Yeah, great. So um, we're approaching the the top of the hour. Um, do we want to turn things over to Q&A? And our emails, by the way, are up on the screen if you have follow-up questions or want to, um, you know, ask something more specific. Or you could also uh, email uh, Abby or Diego, I think, as well. Yes. And um, Gary, can you repost that link? It doesn't seem to be working, chat. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Let me make sure it works in real life. <laughs> but um, make sure you're sending it to everyone, Gary, not just to the um, organizers. Yes, he is. But um, that's mostly what we got. We have time for maybe one or two questions while Gary's looking for the um, the link. And yeah, um, it's... go ahead, Gary. It's uh, there, farmbiztrainer.com. It sends you to a kind of a subset of the farm credit um, website. And you'll see on that on that farmbiztrainer.com, you'll see uh, one page planning spreadsheets. And if you click on the little plus sign, you can click on those interactive spreadsheets that are right there. Diego, I think somebody wanted you to leave up the last slide. Yes, let me go and do that again real quick. Um, question, uh, one of the comments that, that was up there um, was someone that had a 50 page business plan and how do I get it down to 15 pages? Um, I would say to read through it and distill what the, what the key aspects are of your business. You know, think about being concise on those questions, those those who, what, when, and where, you know, who is your business going to be brief description of, of you as the principal, as well as any key employees or advisors that you have, um, you know, what are you going to produce in a, in a nutshell? Um, you know, the marketing, you know, you don't need a whole lot of background about, like I said, the, the global market for broccoli, you know, the key is, what is your local market going to be or who you're, who are you going to be selling directly to? Um, you know, kind of try and distill it down and, um, you know, cut out a lot of the background information, I guess you could say, um, do the best you can on that. I mean, it's, it's, sometimes it's easier to write a really long one than a short one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, try and try and be as concise as you can and, and think about, you know, being precise about your specific business and what you are going to do and who you're going to sell to. What I find a lot of <clears throat> a lot of producers do is spend way too much time talking about how they're going to grow the crop, um, what their production method is. I use a no-till seeder. I hybridize my own seeds. All that, that doesn't matter nearly as much as being able to say, the stuff I grow, I'm going to sell to these people for this amount of money for this time period of the year. And it's going to amount to gross sales of whatever it is. 
Yeah, um, I mean, I would say that in, in my experience at Farm Credit, we see a lot more farmers get into trouble because they fall down in the marketing and the financial management um, more than the more than because they're not good farmers. Um, you know, obviously you have to be a good grower of whether it's livestock or, or plants if you want to succeed. That's kind of the prerequisite to the, the game, right? But um, the, the key things are who you're going to sell to and how you're going to, you know, leverage that to, to have positive net income. Thank you for that. And we got time for one more question. Realistically, as a beginning farmer, how long should it take to complete a viable business plan? And how long should it be? I'm assuming it will vary, right? Yeah, it's going to vary. Um, I would say that that 15 page target is, uh, is a good maximum. Um, you know, if you can't distill your business plan down to within 15 pages, then you, you have really too much stuff in there. Um, and how long, sh how long should it take to complete it? Boy, that's going to really vary from one person to the next. I think a big, a big question is, um, is how fully formed are your, is your business idea? Um, you know, how fully baked is it? Are you a, someone that just kind of are trying to take a dream and make it into reality and you just kind of started that journey? Um, it's going to take you a lot longer than if you are. Uh, someone that's working on a farm right now and you think you want to branch off on your own and you have some real concrete ideas, uh, it's going to be a lot quicker to get there. Um, I guess that's my perspective. And then uh, Ag Plan, did you already have a webinar on that? Uh, Ag Plan is a good resource. Just keep in mind that Ag Plan, if you do all the sections, it's going to lead you to create that 50-page business plan. Um, keep in mind that you can skip or be concise um, a lot of the sections of ag plan. You know, not every, not every section is mandatory, if you will. Um, you know, so pick and choose what are the most relevant to your business. Thank you for that, Chris. And I believe that's about all the time we have left. Um, any last words from you, Gary, or Chris? Uh, good yeah, luck. Yeah, Don't be afraid. And there's, 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 there's a lot of people out there who want to help you and don't, don't forget that, that there's, I mean, Diego and Abby and the farmer veteran coalition can help refer you to people, but there's a lot of people out there that, that are their jobs. My job, Chris's job is helping farmers, beginning farmers, uh, get started. So, um, the main thing is to ask and, if you have a little bit of a business plan, something written down, that's how you start that ask. Uh, remember, the business plan is a tool to, for you to be able to ask for help from other people. Every single little bit that you get is improving your ability to ask for help. And I know we like to do it all ourselves. We're farmers, but, you know, ask for help. Yeah, I'd like to just... Uh echo what Gary said and um, thanks for your time, everyone and your attention. And um, yeah, this was really great. I, I think, um, you know, uh, I think everyone on here has uh, got some good information and uh, good luck with the uh, farmer veteran coalition uh, fellowship applications. Thank you for that. Any last words, Abby? I don't think so. Just reach out if you have any questions. All right. And again, this is being recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel by the end of the week, early next week. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to us. There will be a post-webinar survey. Um, please answer that if you have any questions. We'll be looking at that as well. We have one more webinar planned for early February, just before the application closes. It will be like an open Q&A session. So the questions that you ask in the survey will help us structure that webinar. So just be on the lookout for that. And um, again, thank you all for joining. You have a great day. Thank you all.